your Bible to Luke chapter 2, if you would. Luke chapter 2. We heard some of these verses already in our Advent reading, but we're going to focus in on the servant love of Jesus. Luke chapter 2. Very familiar passage. It says, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David. To be registered with Mary, his betrothed, the one he was engaged to, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And may God add his blessing at the reading of his word this morning. Let's bow for prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you. Thank you for anointing me to be the messenger today of this passage of Scripture and the other Scripture we'll look at. Lord, I know it's not my words, it's the Holy Spirit and the Word of God that transforms lives. So Lord, you know the needs. As the Holy Spirit hovers over this place, you know the needs of each person in this room. And we pray this message would be applicable to them and it would move us more and more closer to becoming like your Son, Jesus Christ whose name we want to honor and glorify today, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we continue our series today called Behold, a Savior is Born. November 26th, we talked about hope. Jared Hall was here last week, and he talked about finding joy and anticipation. And this morning, we're going to talk about the servant love of Jesus. We're going to talk about the way he came into the world, the way he walked among mankind, and finally, the way he died. He was a humble servant through it all. Isn't it amazing how our Lord and Savior, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, came into this world? One of my favorite Christmas songs is by a group called Truth. They put out a Christmas uh, CD back in the 90s. And my favorite song on that CD is called The Way He Came. You see the lyrics on the screen. The first verse, just to think such royalty would come the way he came. In a dusty little town, born in such humility upon a bed of hay, certainly he laid his glory down. Verse 2, who would think this little child would be the promised one? Would the Messiah really come this way? Certainly this was no birthplace for the Son of God. Isn't it amazing how he came? Isn't it amazing the way he came? And then the chorus says, no crown, no throne, no big parade. There were no fanfares played, no jubilant display. Isn't it amazing how he came? Jesus came into this world unlike any other king who had ever lived. He was the king of kings and the Lord of lords before he left heaven. But he chose to come to common people at his arrival. He didn't have an entrance into this world like other kings would. He came in humility, and that's how he lived his life, and that's how he died on the cross as well. So first thing on your outline, let's look at the humble birth of a king. The humble birth of a king. We see, first of all, under that point, the unlikely ancestry. Turn over in your Bible to Matthew chapter 1. I want you to physically do that if you can, or use your phone, and these verses will be on the screen. But I want you to turn over to Matthew chapter 1, and I'll give you a little background as as you turn there. This is an often overlooked passage of scripture when it comes to the Christmas story, but it's very important. The genealogy of a person was important to the Jews, understanding their upbringing, what kind of trade they had, who was their family, was very, very important in that culture. And it's important in the Christmas story for several reasons. One, and most importantly, it established that Jesus was in the line of royalty, the line of David. In 2 Samuel 7, 16, it was prophesied that David's throne would be established and would be eternal. The promise is there. In your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17, we see the genealogy from David to Jesus, from Joseph's side of the family. Although Joseph 
was not his birth father since Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. If you want to look at another passage in the future, in Luke chapter 3, verses 23 through 38, we see the genealogy of David down through Mary as well. So it was important that we understand that it establishes Jesus as the line and the one who would sit on the throne of David. Second, these genealogies are important because it established that Jesus was an historical figure. He was in time and space, just like we are. And that's very important. Thirdly, this lineage in Matthew 1 is an example of God's grace. And that's what I'm going to focus in on for just a moment. If you look at Matthew 1, look at verses 3 through 6. And Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Notice that first woman, Tamar. And Perez, the father of Hezron. And Hezron, the father of Ram. And Ram, the father of Amminadab. And Amminadab, the father of Nashon. And Nashon, the father of Salmon. And Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. That's the third woman. And Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of David, the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the fourth woman in this genealogy, the wife of Uriah. Four women, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba. Tamar, think about her being part of the family tree. She committed incest. She was involved in immorality. She pretended to be a prostitute. She was a Gentile. We think of Rahab. Rahab was a harlot. She lied. She was deceptive and she was a Gentile, a Canaanite. But Hebrews 11.31 called her a woman of faith. Ruth was a woman from Moab, a nation born out of incest. And Bathsheba was involved in an adulterous relationship. Four unlikely women, three are Gentiles, three are involved in some form of sexual immorality, Two are involved in prostitution, and one is an adulteress. All four are in the line that leads to Jesus Christ. Now, why would God include women like that in the list? But it's not just the women. Look at through that passage there. If you look at the whole thing, you think of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David. They were sinners too. Why would God include those people in the genealogy of the perfect Son of God? To remind us that Jesus came to heal the sick and the needy and not the self-righteous and that God can use anyone who trusts in him despite their past. Second of all, we see the unusual circumstances. The unusual circumstances. Verses 1 through 5, we just read these in Luke 2. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And this was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. We see in verse 1 here, Joseph, Mary, and her unborn baby have to leave home and travel to the big city for a census count. This was mandatory for the entire Roman world. Today, we simply mail our census in or we go online and we fill it out. But in this time in history, you had to show up face to face in person. We're discussing events of 2,000 years ago. There were no ultrasounds. There were no due dates. Even with today's technology and advancements in healthcare, you never really know when a baby is coming. And we can assume that Mary did not plan to have her baby anywhere other than her home, and certainly not in a dusty stable. But God had a different plan. Now imagine being far from home, traveling mostly on foot, being extremely pregnant, and not having a place to stay for the night. As we read, the city was filled with travelers all coming in to report for the census. And there literally was no room even at this inn. There was no vacancy for this young family to accompany or to occupy. And hard to imagine, but there was physically no space for them. They were out of options. So Mary and Joseph were given a manger, a place where a feeding trough for animals. And Mary gives birth to Jesus. And as the scripture says, she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger 
because there was no guest room available for them. Thirdly, we see the unexpected arrival. The unexpected arrival. Chuck Swindoll, in his devotional book called Seasons of Life, said this about the birth of Christ. Take the year 1809. The international scene was tumultuous. Napoleon was sweeping through Austria. Blood was flowing freely. Nobody then cared about babies, but the world was overwhelmingly and overlooking some terribly significant births. For example, William Gladstone was born that year. He was destined to become one of England's finest statesmen. That same year, 1809, Alfred Tennyson was born to an obscure minister and his wife. The child would one day greatly affect the literary world in a marked manner. On the American soil, Oliver Wendell Holmes was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And just up the road in Boston, Edgar Allan Poe began his eventful, albeit tragic, life. It was also in that same year that a physician named Darwin and his wife named their child Charles Robert. And that same year produced the cries of a newborn infant in a rugged log cabin in Hardin County, Kentucky. And who was that baby? It was Abraham Lincoln. If there had been news broadcasts at that time, I'm certain these words would have been heard. The destiny of the world is being shaped on the Austria battlefield today. But history was actually being shaped in the cradles of England and America. And similarly, everyone thought taxation was the big news in Luke 2 when Jesus was born. But a young Jewish woman cradled the biggest news of all, the birth of a Savior. We read in Luke 2, verses 6 through 7, And while they were there, Mary and Joseph, the time came for Mary to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Now you would think if God so rules the world as to use an empire-wide census to bring Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem, he surely could have had a room for them available in the inn. Yes, he could have. He absolutely could have. And Jesus could have been born into a wealthy family. When Jesus was in the wilderness fasting and Satan tempted him, he could have turned that stone into bread. Jesus could have called down 10,000 angels in the Garden of Gethsemane And Jesus could have come off that cross himself and saved himself. The question is not what God could do, but what he willed to do. That's the important thing. God's will was that through Christ, he was to become here as a poor peasant person. And though Christ was rich in heaven, yet for your sake, he became poor. The no vacancy signs over the motels in Bethlehem were for your sake, For your sake, he became poor, 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Yes, God could have seen to it that Jesus had a room at his birth, but it would have been a detour from the road to Calvary. See, God rules all things, even hotel capacities and available Airbnbs for the sake of his children. But the road to Calvary begins with a no vacancy sign in Bethlehem and ends with the spitting and scoffing of Jesus on the cross in Jerusalem. Jesus came into the world in a lowly and humble way. And this was all intentional. Jesus wasn't born, as we said, to wealthy parents in a palace like many kings would be. We witnessed the most unexpected arrival of the Savior of the world. God planned this. God connects with humanity in a very vulnerable way. By being born the way he was, where he was, Jesus immediately identifies with the marginalized and the ordinary and the down and out of this world. It is Christmas when we're reminded that God's love is not reserved for the elite, but is accessible to all people. Jesus arrived in an unexpected way, which set the precedent for the rest of his life. And if God shaped the circumstances to fulfill his promise, we have the hope that God is shaping the circumstances of our lives to mold us and to shape us into his image. This time, as I think about the way our world is, I, I, I focus on Romans 12 too. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be faithful in prayer. As I walk around with this hip that needs to be replaced, I'm reminded of Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 9, he says, In my weakness, God says, I show my strength. Your, my grace is sufficient for you. And that's what we do. 
God is shaping the circumstances in our lives to make us more like him, but also to intersect with other people to do ministry. The application here is if God directed the world to fulfill his promise, can we also see his guiding hand directing in our lives daily? If God did that for Jesus, to get him where he needed to be to fulfill a prophecy, how could he not do the same kind of work in the circumstances of our lives? We should take great hope and encouragement in that. Well, next, let's look at who Jesus became and who he was during his time on earth. The humble God becomes a man. Jesus set aside his attributes of being God. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, it says, Who, Christ, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. It's inferred here that Jesus is equal with God. This is the kenosis theory in theological terms. This is Jesus willingly laying aside his divine attributes to identify with us as a man. Now he did from time to time, call on his divine attributes to do miracles, to feed 5,000, to heal people, to remove demons. But in general, he laid them aside. Second of all, Jesus identified with his creation as being a man who came to serve. Look at Philippians 2, the middle of verse 7 through 8. By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, Christ humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. His first cries filled the air of the humblest of settings, a, a, a stable, a place where animals slept and ate, He experienced the limitations and the fragility of humanity from the moment he was born until his death. He felt the warmth of a mother's love and the comfort of a father's protection. He experienced hunger. He experienced thirst. He had to have his diaper changed. He had fatigue. He understood the full spectrum of human emotions. We see him in John 11, 35, weeping at the grave of his friend Lazarus. He was not just part human. He was completely human And pain was not omitted from his experience on earth. We're studying in the men's group about uh, Jesus as a shepherd, a lowly and gentle shepherd. In Hebrews 4, we studied this week, this passage, Hebrews 4, 14 and through 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one in whom every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If you look at verse 15, you see a word, sympathize. Sympathize. I want to focus on that word. God sent his son to planet earth to take on human flesh and walk among us. He experienced everything that a human being could experience and yet was without sin. He can sympathize with us when we come with our emotions and our human needs because he has the t-shirt. He says, I've been there and done that. He knows exactly what each human being is going through at any given time. And the great news is he understands. Then you see in verse 15 where he talks about weaknesses. And this is almost an untranslatable word from the Greek. The best we can come up with is that Jesus sympathizes with our, quote, human condition. He knows that what it's like firsthand to be a human being in this sinful world. This means that our struggles and prayers are not greeted with harshness or condemnation or impatience, but with understanding and sympathy because he's walked in our shoes. We're confident that he will custom make the answer to your prayer And to your need, because he fully understands the human condition because it's a shared experience with him. I can imagine for a moment, a world-renowned artist, he made such beautiful, beautiful paintings that they were in the finest art halls of the world and in museums. And uh, he loved to show off his beauty and the complexity of his paintings, but one day he felt challenged to do something totally different. 
And so he went to his studio and he wanted to draw the simple experience of humanity in everyday society and life. But he was stumped. He didn't know what to do. So he decided to do something unique. He moved out of his studio. He went into neighborhoods and he, for six or seven months, he lived among people. He shared life with them. He saw their emotions. He saw their strengths, their weaknesses. And then after that period of time, he went back into his studio and he began to paint. And it ended up being one of the most simple paintings that he's ever uh, painted before. Well, after that experience, he finished his painting and he carefully put his experience there. And then one day he unveiled this unexpected creation and the world was astounded. Critics and admirers alike were moved by the depth of emotion and the resonance of the piece. It touched their hearts in a way that none of his grand masterpieces had ever done before. And here's what the artist said, quote, in this simple painting, I aim to capture the very essence of our shared humanity, the beauty of everyday life, the emotions that connect us all, and the significance of the ordinary moments we often overlook, end of quote. In a profound way, the artist's journey mirrors that of Jesus in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Just as that artist chose to step into the lives of everyday people to understand their humanity, Jesus, the creator of all things, chose to step into our world through the incarnation as a humble being, and he left the splendor of heaven to fully experience our joys, our struggles, and our sorrows. Jesus was 100% man, but also don't forget that at his birth, even though he did set aside his attributes and his glory, he was still 100% God as well. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 reminds us of that. Therefore, God has highly exalted Jesus and bestowed on him the name that's above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So think about that in the backdrop of what Jesus said his purpose for coming to planet Earth was in Matthew chapter 20, 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, although he was worthy of the world serving him, he says, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see the humility of Christ, the humility of God sending his son to be with us. And so the application to us in Philippians 2, 5 through 11 is in verse 5. It says this, have this mind among yourselves, the mind of Christ that we just described, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And with all that in mind concerning Philippians 2, 5 through 11, what can you do during this season of joy to bring joy to someone by serving? How can you help others to make their season bright? Where can you set aside your pride or your position in order to serve others as Christ served others? We have Dale McCauley here, and I'm just uh, so thankful and proud of our church Friday, Friday afternoon and evening for all the work that was done to minister to him and his family. And I'm just grateful for all of you who came and gave of your time. Matt shared with me that he stopped us on our way out and he said that he was so appreciative of the detail that we went to to care and comfort for their family. And so thank you, church family. That just makes me so proud as pastor. I had a really unique experience yesterday. I was in Fairway buying some groceries. And I ran into a guy I hadn't seen in a couple of years. His name is Bruce. He works across the street here, Quest for Christ, at Pleasant View Elementary School. Well, uh, Derek Armstrong, the pastor at Bet, uh, Bridge Cities Church, was here for the uh, Donna's uh, service. I went back to a, a celebration. They were having a Christmas celebration with their leadership after the service. And Bruce came and told me how moved he was of what this church had done for Dale and his family. But he also told me how much he appreciates our church making an impact in our community. And so I thanked him. I continued to walk away. As I was about ready to check out, he walks up and he gives me 
a $100 gift card from Fairway as a thank you for our church and the community doing what we do for Christ. That's what it's all about. That's what serving in humility is all about. So the application here is, do you have the same mindset that Christ has of being a servant to those around you? Do we have that mindset of Christ, that humility, to be a servant to those around you? Now we're going to look at the end of Jesus' life. And notice some parallels between the cross and the manger. Our last main point is the humility from birth to death of the Son of God. The humility from birth to death of the Son of God. Two things very quickly. Jesus' birth was a gift from God to the world. Jesus' birth was a gift from God to the world, but Jesus' death was the ultimate gift of redemption. Jesus' death was the ultimate gift of redemption. Have you ever thought about this before? There are deep connections between Jesus' birth and the way he died. Have you thought generally about the comparisons between the beginning of life and the end? By God's grace, when many make it to the end of their life, it's beautifully heartbreaking in a way that it reflects from the beginning. The way God writes these stories is clear and specific. He intentionally chose and designed life to happen this way. And this is the same for the story of Jesus. The beginning of his story is just as important as the end, and the end just as important as the in-between. Let's look at some of the ways the birth and death of Jesus intersect. First is that he was rejected of men in Luke 2, 7. And then at the end of his life, Mark 15, 15, he was rejected of men. He was cast outside before his birth that led him to be born in the manger. At the cross, he was rejected and hung between criminals outside the city. Another key detail is that Mary was present at both his birth and his death. She was the bookend to Jesus' life. If you keep looking, there's so many overlaps. Myrrh was given to him by the wise men. Myrrh was poured on him after he was crucified and died and prepared for burial. You think about darkness. He was born in darkness, and then darkness came over the cross. We think about it both. His body was wrapped in a cloth in the manger, and then he was wrapped in clothing to be prepared for burial by Joseph of Arimathea. At both, Herod became involved. In Matthew 2, 7, he called for the religious leaders to say, where is the king of the Jews supposed to be born? And then we know Herod massacred all those children, two years of age and younger. But Herod was there during the trials of Jesus as well. He was a part of that, part of his conviction and execution. At both, there was worship through the first, where the Shepherds and the wise men eventually came and worshipped him, but then there was a mocking worship by the Roman guards. After they beat him, they put the purple cloth on him and a crown of thorns and said, Hail, King of the Jews, in mockery. At both wise men recognized his deity. We see the wise men came, and then we see uh, men at the cross who identified him as Christ. At both Jew and Gentile were there. At both he was hailed as king, though one was in earnest and the other in jest. At both, he was an honorable man named Joseph was present. And Joseph was his father, and Joseph of Arimathea was the man who buried him in his tomb. At both his birth and death, we find the chief priests and scribes involved. Jesus' death and his birth were full of humility and vulnerability. His birth was surrounded by animals in a lowly barn, surrounded by shepherds. But his death, we witnessed Jesus hanging on a cross, crucified and punished alongside common criminals. Neither one of these experiences is mighty or grand. This parallel teaches that Jesus' mission was not one of earthly glory and power, but of sacrificial love and redemption. His birth and death bookend a life characterized by humility and selflessness. Now we can look at the manger in Bethlehem and see it was the ultimate foreshadowing of Jesus' death. Jesus' birth signaled the very start of his journey toward selflessness and sacrifice for all of the world's sin. He was born to die. 
And he came to earth to offer himself as the perfect lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. On the cross, Jesus fulfilled this purpose with unparalleled love and devotion. He endured excruciating physical and spiritual pain, willingly surrendering his life to atone for our sins. Just as the birth of Jesus was a gift to the world, his death was the ultimate gift of redemption. Jesus was a servant born in the humblest of ways. He was the king of kings, and he chose to come to earth to live the perfect life so that we, his people, could be close to our heavenly father. And without his death and resurrection, we would still be dead in our sin and have no hope of eternity with God. I recently read this beautiful quote, and it's the bottom of your notes here. Christ was content with a stable when he was born so that we could have a mansion when we die. Think about that. Christ was content with a stable when he was born, the purpose so that you and I could have a mansion when we die. Here's the application. Do you walk in humility and awe when you consider that the God of the universe loves you and came to earth for you? And I can honestly say, if you were the only person who ever lived, Jesus would have come and died on the cross for you. That's how much he loves each of us individually. In closing, when we reflect on the birth and death of Jesus, we see the amazing ways that his life was completely divine and how it is all connected. From the unexpected arrival in the humble manger to the ultimate sacrifice on the cross, Jesus' journey on earth illustrates his life as one of the most humblest servants. The birth of Jesus in a lowly stable was a deliberate act of humility, setting the tone for his entire mission. He identified with the marginalized, the ordinary, teaching us that God's love is accessible to all, regardless of where you are in life. So let's do all we can through prayer, through our words and our actions, to reflect the attitude Jesus had to be a humble and available servant to those around us that we can help, that God brings our way. Here's our key thought. Our key thought is this, that Jesus' journey on planet Earth illustrates his life as a humble servant. So should our lives. So their takeaway today is may we have the humility and the servant-like attitude of Jesus as we encounter people throughout this Christmas season. I want to give you three questions to ponder. I don't often read these every week, but I think these are important to read and for you to reflect on as we go to prayer in just a moment to challenge you throughout this week, as you read the story of Jesus' birth, number one, how does it strike you that God works in the details of your life? You're not here by accident. God brought you here today. Everything you do is not by accident. God ordains it. God has numbered your days and he's guiding you. Second of all, how can you work on maintaining an attitude of serving others this week? First of all, we have to be intentional. We have to be looking for the opportunities. Thirdly, when you personally consider the Christmas story, how odd are you when you think that Jesus did all this for me? I want to make it very personal. So as we go to prayer today, if you have any spiritual needs at all, don't hesitate to stop myself or Aaron Barfels or Mike Fenley out in the lobby, and we'd be more than willing to pray with you and talk to you about any of your needs. But help us. Lord, this week to go out and to serve others like Jesus served us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we could pause and reflect from birth to resurrection to ascension. Lord, you came here not to be served, although you were so worthy, worthy to be worshiped, Lord. But you came to serve others and to give your life as a ransom for many. And we know ultimately that was on the cross, but we know in his life, he was constantly giving to others through miracles, through teachings, through healings, through exercising demons, through being an example of humility by washing the disciples' feet. Lord, help us. Help us to reflect on the servant love of Jesus as we go out and apply this to our lives. We pray and ask these things. In Jesus' name, amen.